I served in the USAF and USAF after April, <coughs> after 18 September 1947 during World War II. Uh, primarily, I served in World War II, and of course, I went on to retire and, uh, and served in the Cold War also. I retired as Major United States Air Force June 30th, 1963. Okay, and the interviewers? And the interviewers present, Scotty Springston and Don Byers. All right. Jesse, we thank you for coming to talk to us today. And uh, as we've started off with all of the interviewees, we've asked them to tell us what you remember about December 7, 1941. Well, on December 7th, 1941, uh, I was in my third, my fourth year in college. And when that happened, uh, everyone, of course, was absolutely surprised. Some people didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. And very, very few people were actually acquainted with Hawaii. Uh, so when a, the next day, when President Roosevelt uh, had his radio speech to the nation, uh, everybody <clears throat> were right at their radios to listen to what he had to say. And after that, the people, as surprised as they were, they <clears throat> actually got together. Uh, lots of people enlisted in the service, and the other people did everything they could for the war effort. So, so what kind of inter interaction did you have with the other people? Was it a total surprise? Was there horror? How did they react? Your colleagues? It, it, was, it was an absolute total surprise because in those days, in those days, nobody ever dreamed of aircraft carriers and uh, especially uh, the Japanese coming in from the north and uh, bombing Pearl Harbor. And of course, like I say, the word Pearl Harbor was very, very little known at that particular time. And, uh, and a lot of people uh, stateside had sons and daughters in the service. And of course, <clears throat> they were very, very interested in what is happening. Of course, information didn't pass very quickly or easily in those days. Uh, Hawaii is located about 2,500 nautical miles uh, from California, and uh, the only way to get there was by ship. And, uh, and uh, the people uh, were all uh, just terrified about getting news of their loved ones. And uh, after the news came, of course, then came the grief. Well, when did you enter the service? I, I first entered the service in 1937 in the National Guard in Pennsylvania. I spent about four years in the National Guard in Pennsylvania, and I had two years of uh, ROTC in college. And uh, then I got out of the, uh, uh, the uh, National Guard, uh, and I, uh, during, after, after Pearl Harbor, uh, then I, in 1942, I took a cadet exam for the, uh, for the uh, <coughs> Air Force and uh, qualified, and on uh, the 10th of July in 1942, I actually entered the uh, service first of all in a reserve status, and then called to active duty for navigator training. Okay, so tell us about your training. Where did you train? What did you do? Well, the training, I, I was, uh, <coughs> I went into the service in Columbus, Ohio, okay. and uh, we were then taken to a classification center in Nashville, Tennessee. I always wanted to be a navigator. I had dreamed of it, actually, in my high school days, and I sent for literature and all this, so I was pretty well acquainted with it. So when we got to the classification center, uh, I just put in for, a, nav for <coughs> a navigator, and of course you pass all kinds of testing and psychological testing and so forth, and I qualified for navigation training. I went on to pre-flight training in Monroe, Louisiana at Selman Field, and uh, 
then on to, uh, uh, to advanced training for navigation. That's the flying portion of it. The first portion, uh, about uh, seven weeks, was all academic. And then the next portion, the advanced training, was all flying. So I uh, graduated from navigation school and was commissioned a second lieutenant on the 25th of September, 1943. I chose then to go to uh, B-17 training uh, and from there we went on leave and my next station was at Ephrata, Washington and we formed a crew there. And from Ephrata, Washington, we went on to uh, Avon Park, Florida for our advanced B-17 training in combat training. And after we completed that, our complete crew left and went to Savannah, Georgia to Hunter Airfield and we picked up a brand new B-17. And uh, when a pilot signed for it, you just don't s sign for a brand new B-17. You sign for four engines, the body of the aircraft, and so forth and so on. So you're, you're, you're actually signing a list of uh, <coughs> pieces that go up to make, the B make up the B-17, and you sign on a dotted line, and then after a few days of checkout, we swung the compass, did a lot of things down there. We left and uh, oh, by air, pick up the airplane, left by air, and went to Morrison Field, Florida, from there on to uh, Waller Field in uh, uh, Trinidad, and then from there to Belém, Brazil, for the southern route to Fortaleza, Brazil, and then a hop across the uh, South Atlantic Ocean to uh, Roberts Field in uh, Senegal. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from Senegal, we flew up to Casablanca, and there we got the airplane, what we called combat ready. Had, uh, had extra plating put in it, guns, and a whole thing. We stayed there about 10 days doing this, and then from there, we flew to Algiers, and then from there to Tunis, and then from there to uh, Foggia, Italy, and our air base at Foggia, Italy was Amendola. And we got there on the 21st of January, 1944. Sound like, a, sound like an interesting trip. What was it like as a young navigator with, with about, what, 200 hours of flying to take off across the Atlantic Ocean with the instruments that you had in those days? It, it was a little scary, and, and because at that time of the year, they had what they call the intertropical front. <clears throat> about midway between, uh, it's active about midway between the South American <clears throat> mainland and the African mainland. And they told us when we we're going to enter the, fr enter the front, and about, spent about 30 or 40 minutes in it, and then get on the other side, and it was a pretty bumpy ride, a pretty bumpy ride, uh, even at our altitude. And, uh, but we got through it and, uh, and landed safely at Roberts Field in, uh, in uh, Senegal. Certainly we're glad to see that first landfall, though, weren't you? Sure was, sure was. It was, a, it was real happy to see it. Tell us what your conditions were when you, when you went to your permanent base in Italy. What kind of living conditions did you have? Well, <clears throat> We were, like I said, our base was at Amendola. They had several bases around Foggia there. Our base was Amendola. And of course, <clears throat> the squadron that I joined, the 49th Bomb Squadron, they had just come up from North Africa. They had only been there a very, very short while. So things were uh, a little bit uh, raw around there. We asked the first night all of us slept in a tent on the ground, and then we asked, when are we going to get our quarters? They said, well, we got a little place up here that uh, uh, we marked off for your quarters, and you go out there and stand in front of it, and, uh, and uh, a truck will come by. Well, we went up there, now this is the officer's quarters. We went up there and stood on our uh, particular plot of ground. A truck did come by, and he tossed us 
a uh, squad tent all all folded up that that's your quarters put it up uh -huh. so we put it up no floor when you got up your your, your feet uh, were right in the, the grass no stove you had to make your own stove and we made a stove out of out of a five gallon can and uh, no place to hang anything all you had was a tent and a cot with a couple of blankets so things were not looking up. They you had, had you have just temporary mess halls, or how did you get fed? Well, we had, <clears throat> we had, uh, well, it was, uh, it, it was sort of temporary, but going into permanent. Uh, the mess hall wasn't too bad. It was in a tent, but it wasn't too bad. And uh, they, they just started building an officers' club, and uh, but, but they fed us pretty good, and uh, and uh, it wasn't too far to go. Mm -hmm. What kind of training did you get in theater? Did you get any special training for? Tell us about before your mission, what your first combat mission, what happened? Well, uh, when, a, when a crew, a trained crew, gets to a combat area, what they do is split them up and uh, so that you can fly with a seasoned, in my, my particular case, a seasoned navigator for a mission or two. And uh, same thing with the pilots, co-pilots. and. Uh, and the, uh, the engineer and some, some of the gunners. And after that's over with, <clears throat> then you're back, <clears throat> you're back in uh, crew status and you fly with your own crew. So they don't let any, uh, uh, any inexperienced person just go out alone uh, on a mission. You're always, your first couple of missions are always with a seasoned crew. Mm -hmm. Did that, what, do you remember that first mission? What was it like? <clears throat> Well, the, the seasoned uh, crew members said, oh, this is just going to be a milk run. So nothing to worry about at all. So my first mission, I get out to the, we get briefed and I get out to the airplane and uh, we all got aboard and said, don't worry about a thing. I met, the, met all the people. We were flying tail end Charlie and what I mean by tail end Charlie, uh, in, in a diamond formation, your aircraft is a tail end aircraft. And uh, so uh, we take off and uh, we get to the target safely. The target is the submarine pens at Salon de Provence, which is in a Marseille area. So they're pretty well protected by the German uh, anti-aircraft guns. So as we approached the target, seemingly, at least to me, all hell broke loose. And pretty soon <clears throat> we start hearing uh, stuff underneath the aircraft and the guys would tell me, you know, they said, that's gravel. And of course, gravel is the, uh, <clears throat> or, or gravel is the, uh, the uh, pieces of the bomb <clears throat> that, that is uh, broken up underneath your aircraft. So you, when, you, when you get gravel, it's sort of a warning sign. And sure enough, they readjusted their guns down there and uh, we got hit pretty well. Uh, we're in a nose of the aircraft. It's a plastic nose, me and the bombardier. Next thing I know, the nose caves in and it's cold, it's 25,000 feet, and temperature's about uh, 25 or 30 degrees below zero, and uh, you have an oxygen mask on, the icicles in the oxygen mask are hanging about three feet down, and, uh, and everything is, you're cold, and, 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 uh, and uh, the, when, the nose, when the nose caved in, uh, that was a, a real disaster. So <clears throat> we got our bombs dropped, and uh, on the way back, the aircraft commander says to me, he said, hi. He says, give me a uh, course to uh, Corsica, which was an emergency landing spot. And he said, I want to go into Gisinaccia, Corsica, which is a, uh, a major uh, uh, British base. So none of my compasses were working, nothing was working, but we have a way at that time, we had a way with a Williams plotter that we could uh, 
we could uh, give them a heading to uh, go where we want to go. So I did that, and sure enough, we got to Gisenaccia and landed safely. And uh, I was getting out of the airplane, and somebody pops his head up through the hatch, said, how'd it go, old chop? I said, I said, uh, Sarge, I said, you better ask one of these other guys. I said, this is my first mission, and I really don't know. And uh, so later on, I found out that he was the British wing commander of the base, <laughs> who was really a nice fella. He went out and got sandwiches for us and all of this sort of thing, and, uh, and it was real nice. So <clears throat> we were so, uh, we were so uh, torn up, the airplane was so torn up, I looked at a hole in the back, it looked like a Jeep could go through it. We had to leave our airplane there. And we bummed a ride with uh, another crew, and we got to Foggia, back to our base, at about uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock that night. So it was quite an experience, and I said to myself, I said, if every mission's like this, I don't know how long I'm gonna last. <laughs> but uh, it was, it, it was, uh, it was quite a uh, lesson. You didn't, you didn't experience any fighter interceptions? No fighters, no fighters that day. It was just, just, uh, uh, just uh, flak from the, uh, from the Germans. And they were quite accurate with their, <clears throat> with their anti-aircraft guns. They had enough experience. And, uh, and they had plenty of guns around the target. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand you, had, you supported the invasion, invasion at Anzio. Could you tell us that story? Yes. Now, An Anzio, they, they, like I say, they, uh, the ground forces had, had just come up from North Africa, and uh, the, uh, the uh, Air Force moved along with it, the Air Corps did, and Anzio wasn't located too far from where we were. Uh, the lines were, were just about at Anzio, and it was only about a 45-minute uh, 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 plane ride up to Anzio. So what we would do uh, when, it, when, when the target, target was Anzio, as a matter of fact, we, sometimes we flew, flew twice a day there to support, support the invasion troops. And <clears throat> we were on the uh, Adriatic side, uh, Foggia and Amandola on the Ad Adriatic side, right close to the heel of the boot in Italy. So we flew, uh, <clears throat> we flew across to Naples, and then we flew up to a group of islands off the coast of Naples called Ponzas Islands. And there, <clears throat> the group would circle and keep our place there, and we would go in one airplane at a time. And sometimes we'd get down to 13,000 feet, and the Germans there, uh, in, 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 uh, in support of their mission, they had any aircraft guns on rails, and they could uh, they could stay with you uh, from <clears throat> from uh, the bottom portion uh, of of Anzio all the way to uh, an arc of about 120 degrees. They could stay with you as you go in and come back out, and of course we all wore helmets, and uh, they were so good with their anti aircraft that you wish your helmet would uh, fit down over your ankles. <laughs> and uh, lots and lots of, uh, uh, of uh, gravel, lots of hits. And then after we completed our uh, mission, we'd fly back to base, which was only about 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And then at times in the afternoon, we'd go back up and uh, support them again. And uh, so much so that, uh, that the invasion was successful. How long did that invasion take? as you remember? As I remember, uh, at least, at least uh, 10 days, at least 10 days. Now, I could be off uh, on that some, but, but uh, I know that uh, it was a primary mission for us for uh, about a 10-day period. Did you encounter any air-to-air -air at that time, or was it still all Air ground. It, it was all air, air ground, right. It was all uh, all in the aircraft uh, at that time, right. Mm -hmm. You Did you encounter the Italian Air Force at any time? No, no. I think the Italian Air Force was just about non-existent. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. Well, did you encounter the Luftwaffe at any time? Well, not on not on those particular missions. But <clears throat> when we flew into Germany, like into Regensburg, or uh, or up into Austria, any time we crossed a certain line where the uh, Germans had air bases, <clears throat> we would make contact with uh, with their fighters, and uh, and they would stay with you. Uh, as long as they could, and they could just, just hop because their bases were located <clears throat> in such a way they could spend about 10 or 15 minutes with you, come back down and refuel at the next base and come back up to meet you before you get to target. Mm -hmm. they, and they were very, very good at uh, attacking, very, very good. Their pilots were good. How, long, how large of formations were you flying in? How many aircraft? I don't know the exact number of aircraft, but I could uh, sum them up, though. Uh, we usually, in a wing formation, would usually have uh, four squadrons. And uh, like uh, we had the 49th Bomb Squadron and, and a 20th Bomb Squadron, and there were several others, and uh, we would all form right over our base uh, and usually usually you'd you'd be part of a wing formation and usually uh, you flew uh, uh, with four squadrons that make up the wing and of course there were other wings also in the area but you were always concerned about your own squadron and right over right over the base it'd take about an hour to form all the aircraft, and uh, in this particular case, it would be uh, oh, 14, about about 28 aircraft uh, in in our particular uh, two squadrons, and then other other uh, wings would join too, and then you'd head for the target. Okay, when as a navigator or a bombardier, as you went into the target, did you bomb? Did you bomb off of leads drop, or did you? Right, we we. Well, not necessarily leads drop, but <clears throat> we would get to a point called the initial point. From the initial point to the target, that was the bomb run. And uh, of course, the lead had already dropped a long time before you. And uh, uh, once we turned on the initial point going to the target, <clears throat> it was up to the pilot and bombardier to coordinate their activities and for the last minute the bombardier with his bomb site actually took over the control and uh, he had it all <coughs> all uh, figured in and when he said bombs away uh, we were with the target and uh, and uh, away went all the bombs we carried 12 usually 12 500 pound bombs mm -hmm. six on each side of the bomb bay and and uh, uh, each aircraft each b-17 carried the same load mm -hmm. were there any special missions that you remember that stand out in your mind other than your last one well the first one was sort of special but one of the missions that i flew on was uh, on 15th of February, 1944. We were <clears throat> briefed to bomb the Monte Cassino Abbey, which is a Catholic abbey uh, located atop Monte Cassino. And of course, the big talk was, do we have the Pope's approval? Do we have this? Do we have that? Are the monks still living in there? And it was a uh, concern, but the, uh, our, uh, uh, squadron commander <clears throat> and the wing commander assured us that they had approval from the highest authority to uh, bomb the Abbey because it was German activity there. So we were the first squadron over on February the 15th, 1944, and we actually went down to 13,000 feet, and it was going up the Gargliano River Valley and the uh, 
Abbey sat on Monte Cassino at top of it, a beautiful, beautiful area of buildings and everything. And uh, it was, it was uh, just a, a sad day to have to uh, bomb uh, this particular abbey because we knew that uh, it uh, was a, uh, a holy place and uh, the, uh, if the Germans were using it, that's pretty, pretty much, they were pretty much cowards. But we went in at about 13,000 feet and of course everybody followed behind us and we destroyed that abbey on the 15th of February, 1944. And of course, it got a lots of publicity, lots of pictures taken and all of that. And uh, I learned, I've been to Italy several times since then. I never did get to see the abbey, but I learned from people there that they rebuilt it and it's standing in the same place, a beautiful structure, much bigger than it was before. Okay. Tell us about your mission on 24 February. Well, on, on 24 February, 1944, now this is winter time. The winters in Italy weren't, weren't, where we were, weren't too harsh, but they were cold enough. But we took off and we were supposed to bomb the uh, uh, ME-109 assembly plant at, at Steyr, S-T-E-Y-R, Austria. Now, I wasn't flying with my crew at that time, and uh, navigators were in short supply. For some unknown reason, uh, they were getting killed more so than other crew members were. Uh, and uh, sometimes that put you as a navigator on another crew, and that particular day, my pilot uh, was with another crew, and I was with another crew uh, flying that mission. and. Uh, we took off, formed with the, with the group and the squadron, and just before, just before we left to go <coughs> on course, uh, the pilot looked out and he had uh, a gas cap that was loose and it was siphoning fuel over the wing. So he asked to depart the formation. We went back, on <coughs> back to base, landed the airplane, the maintenance man went out there and put the gas cap back on, and to many people's surprise, uh, he took back off again. And we, uh, we caught up with the wing, got back in, back in formation, and proceeded on course to the uh, target. Well, as you, <clears throat> as you move north in Italy, uh, you can see the snow getting uh, higher and higher in the mountains and uh, it looked pretty cold down there. So uh, we uh, did what we could to dress up as much as we could, uh, get our gloves on and everything. And uh, w soon as we passed the German lines, which were oh, about halfway up in Italy at that time, the German fighters met us and they would stay with us for 10 or 15 minutes, go back down, refuel, and come back up. And uh, they <clears throat> did their best to shoot us out of the sky, but we managed to get to the target. And our fighters, our friendly fighters, weren't supposed to meet us until five minutes after target time. Five minutes is a long time when you're waiting for fighter support. And uh, so we, uh, get to the initial point, and I explained the initial point before, that's where we turned on to the target. Well, by the time we got to the initial point, we were shot up so badly by strictly by uh, enemy fighters. When we turned on to the initial point onto the bomb run, we didn't quite make it to the target before the pilot gave the alarm to bail out. We were in such bad shape. So uh, the temp at that time, our heaters never worked, never worked. The temperature at that time was about 52 degrees below zero, both inside and outside the airplane. Very, very cold. And uh, I didn't have a heated suit on because there were no heated suits available for issue. They were all out. Neither did the bombardier. 
mainly the heated suits were saved for the enlisted men, the gunners uh, in the aircraft, waste, also the ball and uh, tail gunners. It was cold, pretty cold back there too. <clears throat> so gave the gave the uh, signal to bail out. So uh, you bail out in a certain procedure. So uh, me and my bombardier are discussing who's going to go first. And I said, uh, Bob, you go first. Bob Tiffany was our bombardier. He said, no, he said, you go first. I said, just hold it. I said, uh, I got to go back and get my cap. He said, you don't need a cap. Well, I went back, but I, didn't, I, I, I couldn't find my cap, so I came back down. And to this day, we don't know who went out first. Don't know who went out first. But I'll tell you what, when we, when we, when we knocked that hatch out, and the hatch is about as big as this table here, it looks like it was big enough to drive a Jeep through. When you look down there at that uh, uh, snowy uh, ground, uh, you wonder whether you're going to make it or not. So whoever went out first, I don't know. But <clears throat> when I left, I tried to uh, tried to delay my jump about 10,000 feet to get out of all the fire uh, that uh, was up at uh, our altitude, and of course to get out of the thin air because at that altitude the air is pretty thin, and uh, the partial pressure of oxygen is not like it is on the ground. So I rip I pulled my ripcord what I thought was about 10,000 feet that I dropped about 10,000 feet, and uh, sure enough, it opened. And as I'm going down, as I'm going down, uh, I was going right by the book. I said, I don't want to land in those trees down there, so I better slip my chute. And I went and slipped my chute, and just then I came crashing down through the trees. And I hung up in a, uh, in a big pine tree, about 30, 35 feet from the ground. And of course, my hands were so cold, I couldn't manipulate the, the, the buckles on my chute at all. So I had to try to warm my hands up some. Finally, in about 15 minutes or 30 minutes, I got enough uh, <clears throat> warmth in my hands to be able to unbuckle the chute. I unbuckled the chute, climbed down a tree, and I climbed down <clears throat> in the snow about, this, about as deep as this table here. So uh, I tried to get my thoughts together and everything. I left the of course, I left the chute hanging in a tree, and I said, which way do I want to go? And of course, the first step I took, I, I, I was in uh, a snow almost waist deep. And, uh, but I was plodding along, and just then I see the, uh, the, uh, what turned out to be the Landwacht, L-A-N-D-W-A-C-H-T, who are the land watchers, spotters, if you will, uh, that spot parachutes coming down, and uh, their business is to capture you. And we were something like uh, maybe uh, or three or four hundred yards apart, and they were walking up to me, and I was walking toward them because there was no other no other way to go uh, because of the snow. And in about fifteen or twenty minutes, we met. And of course, they had all the guns, and uh, I had no gun because uh, our uh, crew members were told not to take guns on their uh, bombing missions over Germany because some of our people, crew members, have been known to be shot with their own gun. So they had all the guns. There was about three or four of them, and uh, they had everything from a, a pistol to, uh, to a uh, carbine. And uh, when I got there, of course, they think I have a gun, and they search me and do all of this. And uh, they're, they're, they're probably more excited than I am. But nevertheless, I had a hard time proving that I didn't have a gun. After, after we uh, settled that, <clears throat> then they marched me with my hands up uh, through the snow, uh, which had been uh, uh, sort of tampered, <clears throat> tamped down by uh, people walking on a path. And uh, they marched me through the village onto the uh, Burgermeister's office. 
in a little town called Otnang, O-T-T-N-A-N-G. And uh, this is in the Bavarian Alps. And at ground temperature then, I learned later, was about 16 degrees below zero. So it wasn't, it wasn't a warm place at all. So they got me to the Burgomeister's office, and that was my initial interrogation. After they got um, their initial interrogation, I was always complaining about, uh, about my uh, boots having uh, uh, twigs in them, pine cones, and everything else in them. And it was hard for me to explain to them, but then I took my shoes off. They let me take my shoes off, and I poured all this <coughs> stuff on the table there. They all laughed. And then after that, they put me in a cell. And uh, it was a dark cell with an old rusty cot. And they put me there. And I was only there a short time when a lady came up, opened a, the little door there, and she said, are you British or American? I said, I'm an American. And, uh, and then she left. Then they came and got me. <coughs> and marched me up the hill, a very slippery hill, to uh, what was then known as a push hall. This is where all the Nazi activity was. And this is where some of my crew members were. They had already captured them, mainly my bombardier and some enlisted people. So we were, we were in there for just a short while, and of course they had the guns on us. and. Uh, they were deciding what to do with us. Well, they marched us back down the hill across from Burgomeister's office into a regular uh, German pub, a public, uh, pub public beer garden. We went in there, and there's a bar and uh, a lounge and all the, uh, <clears throat> all the, the things that uh, places like that usually have. And the people that ran this place, uh, the man, he was a, a prisoner of the Italians uh, in World War II, World War I, I should say, World War I. And he, uh, he was uh, sort of sympathetic to our plight. And he talked to his wife, and she fed us the nicest breakfast the next morning. And I had 55 cents in my flight suit, and I tipped her 55 cents. <laughs> and that's all I had. So we stayed there about three days. Slept on the floor, watched all the activity. At about noon, people started coming in. The first thing they would say was, Heil Hitler. When a phone would ring, the first thing they'd say was, Heil Hitler. And this would go on and on and on. So they had a, a uh, major in a constabulary by the name of Charlie Schneider, and he was in charge of us, and he was having fun. He would come there about noon and stay till they closed, and he was having fun with all the girls. So after about the second day, my bombardier, uh, Lieutenant Tiffany, uh, we asked him to say this. He, he asked uh, uh, Major Schneider, he says, can we have some beer? Sure, sir beer. So we were sitting up at the bar drinking beer in the evening with all these people around us, you know, and uh, having a lot of fun. So then we asked uh, Mr. Schneider, can we have Fraulein? Oh, he said, Nick's, Nick's Fraulein. <laughs> Nick's Fraulein, just beer, see. So we never, get, never did uh, get any Frauleins, but we got our beer. But then about the third day, the party was over. They came and got us in a, in a GI truck, took us down to the railroad station, put us aboard the <coughs> train, and took us to Frankfurt, uh, Germany. And I sat in a seat right next to a, uh, it was, uh, we were on a, a, a train that uh, the school children were carried on. So I sat next to about a seven or eight year old boy and a cute little, guy, and uh, I asked him some questions. He speak good English. I said, where'd you learn your English? He said, in school. And so we had a nice conversation. And uh, I told him who I was and all this sort of thing, and he didn't seem alarmed at all. 
And uh, so we got to Frankfurt. The day we got to Frankfurt, the, uh, the uh, British came the night before and happened to lob one of their bombs right into the train station. So the Germans weren't happy with us at all, at all. So we got off there and uh, got a streetcar and went to an interrogation center called Dulag Luft. And of course, I was a second lieutenant. And uh, so we got there, and that's where they interrogate you. And uh, they uh, bring you in to the interrogation room one by one. And of course, they know quite a bit about you before you get there. And uh, they ask you some uh, real frank military questions. They wanted to know about the bomb site. They wanted to know who the rest of the crew were, what was your bombing mission, and all those things. And of course, the only thing we're able to tell them is our name, rank, and service number, that's all. And after you do that a, a dozen times, they, they sort of <clears throat> get a little angry and then put you in a, uh, what I called a smokehouse. <clears throat> it was a, a room about as wide as this table, about that square, about five feet square, and it went up about 15 feet. And uh, there was nothing in the room at all. The heater was up on top. It was about 100 degrees in there. They made sure that you were uncomfortable. Then they had a little doggy door on the bottom, and that's where you, they fed you the swill that they served. <coughs> And after they kept you in there for all oh, three or four hours, <clears throat> they'd come back and get you and feel that they soften you up a little bit and reinterrogate you. And they'd do that two or three times, and then after a while, if they got nothing out of you, they sent you back to, uh, to your regular quarters. And then after we got all our people uh, interviewed and all that, then they took us to a place called Wetzlar, W-E-T-Z-L-A-R, and uh, there they uh, started us uh, on our POW life, which essentially they took everything you had and you took it off, <clears throat> you, you, you stripped down to a naked body, and then you started from scratch, and they inspected all of your uh, body cavities to make sure you weren't carrying anything that was unauthorized. And uh, then you went to another room and they issued you some clothing and uh, a Red Cross parcel. And uh, I shouldn't say a parcel, a Red Cross uh, uh, convenience uh, uh, bag. And uh, the last thing they issued was a field jacket and on the back, in big red letters, it just said P.W. for prisoner of war. And then after we got all that done, we uh, got on the train, and we were we didn't know where we were going. Actually, finally, rumor had it that we were going to the prison camp, and which particular prison camp they finally found out was uh, Stalag Luft One which was up on the Baltic Sea, and here we are in Frankfurt. And for the next three days and four nights, we're in a, what we call a 40 and 8. We're in a boxcar with a little bit of straw on the floor, very little heat, and practically no food, and uh, we're on our way to uh, uh, Stalag Luft 1, which is about all 140 miles north of Berlin and uh, Frankfurt south of Berlin, south and west. And uh, we were on this train all that time and it seems that when, when night came we were always in some marshalling yard and uh, we were afraid that the British were going to bomb it at night. But fortunately uh, we didn't get bombed. Some, some, uh, some POW boxcars did. We didn't. We arrived at Stalag Luft 1 
on the 4th of March, uh, 1944. And from there, we got our room assignments, and, uh, and uh, we started our prisoner of war uh, tour right there. And uh, most of the rooms in our barracks were 14-man uh, rooms. There were a couple of four-man rooms and a couple of two-man rooms and one six-man room. But in a 14-man room, uh, we had 14 people living in there with bunks uh, three high and uh, very, very little communal space, a table about this size for all the 14 people to congregate around. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, very convenient at all for anybody. Of course, uh, the Germans uh, designed it that way so it wouldn't be too convenient for you. We did have inside toilets and we had uh, wash uh, sinks for washing. We didn't have showers unless you wanted to go to a communal shower once a week and it'd take you to uh, a, a, a special building for that once a week for showering. The showers lasted about 45 seconds and that was about it. And uh, uh, so that's how, that's where we lived. And uh, now do you want to go on, go on from there? Uh, yeah, just basically, uh, do you think your treatment was because you were a flyer was any different than other POWs? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, the Germans, uh, they were uh, very uh, uh, methodical about uh, where they put their POWs, the enemy POWs. All the Air Force, the Air Force types, were in one camp. And they separated the officers from the enlisted men. For instance, in our particular camp, there were no enlisted men. And then the enlisted men were in other camps in Poland and uh, other parts of Germany. And uh, I don't think that we got any favorite treatment, but uh, <laughs> some of the prisoners in other camps when you said, when I heard uh, about Stalag Luft one, they say, "Oh, that's the uh, <coughs> that, that's the that's for the elite." Mm -hmm. And uh, but believe me, there was nothing the elite about the camp at all. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we had the camp was originally designated for the Brits, the British, and they were the original ones there. We had some British that were there ever since uh, 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 the uh, French invasion. And, uh, and they were there a long time. And the, uh, the British Air Force people were there a long time. Now, after, after uh, the raids start happening with rapidity over Germany, the air crews came in quite fast. And I was in what's called the North Compound 1, and it filled up. They built a North Compound 2, and it filled up. Built a North Compound 3, and it filled up. And uh, finally, as the war ended, uh, there were about 10,000 prisoners there. Were you given adequate food? I think the biggest problem there, as I could see it, was lack of food and lack of heat. Our food, when the Red Cross parcels were coming in, seemed uh, to sustain us. But the Germans always uh, cited that the uh, bombers would knock out the, the uh, food shipments from the Red Cross and we wouldn't get any Red Cross parcels. So when those periods came, uh, we ate mainly rutabagas, perhaps one potato a day, German bread, and uh, that was it. And at night, we'd get uh, about a half a liter of horse meat stew. And uh, they always said that uh, horse meat stew is fresh because from 
recently bombed out horses. But let me tell you what, it was, it, that, that was tough to take. <laughs> but uh, I, I lost about 50 pounds uh, while I was there. Of course, some people lost more, some people lost less. But you didn't see too many fat people there, believe me. Tell us about your release from cap captivity. Well, <clears throat> what, what, what had happened uh, long about uh, uh, April of 1945, we could hear the guns in the distance. And of course, the Americans were coming from the west, and the uh, Russians were coming from the east. And we could, we could hear the uh, bombings and uh, all of the uh, <clears throat> war activities around us. So finally, the Germans started blowing up the installation, not necessarily the barracks, but their particular uh, installations, for instance, their electric power supply and, and uh, so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, uh, we knew that the end was near, so we started digging trenches and so forth uh, to, uh, in case the place was invaded. But it wasn't the, uh, the uh, Americans didn't quite make it to us before the Russians. The Russians came in, uh, I think it was uh, about April of the 30th of 1945, and they came in as a conquering army, and, and uh, to the victor goes the spoils. They, the Russian army at that time, the only thing that the uh, quartermaster was issuing them was vodka, and they would live off the land. So uh, the, uh, the uh, ranking general there, he came to our senior light officer and said, said, have your people ate any meat lately? He says, my people have never had any meat. He said, okay. So the next morning I go down in front of the gate main gate down there, and about mid-morning I see uh, uh, the Russians, they all had a burp gun around them and a, and a flask, and they were, they've been drinking, and they're herding about a hundred head of cattle into the camp. And then in about three days, we had all the meat we could ever have, all the meat we could ever have. And of course, they went out in the countryside, and just got them, and uh, brought them into camp, and, and uh, and uh, we, had, we had some terrific uh, meals. <clears throat> and they did everything in a big way. They, uh, we wanted to open the airport. Uh, our senior night officer wanted to open the airport so that the B-17s could come in. And uh, he asked uh, the Russians to uh, help out too. Well, an equal number of Russians and an equal number of uh, Americans went to the airport and get to get all the communications going and all this sort of thing. And, uh, and uh, the next day, the, uh, the Russian general says, our officers are not working with your enlisted men. Oh, why not? They said, it's against, it's against our protocol. They said, well, okay, we'll fix that. So our senior light officer temporarily commissioned all our sergeants. Uh -huh. And uh, they would not work together real well, and the, 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 uh, the Russian general was real happy about the whole thing, and they got the airport going. We're good. And, uh, but they put on USO shows for us. And just all of that, they, they're big about uh, entertainment, big about entertainment. And uh, there's, a, there's a funny thing I want to say. There's a funny thing I want to say about the Russians. Had a nice, beautiful American Jeep drove up with a, with a Russian officer in charge, and uh, he stopped, we're talking to him, and I'm talking to him, I know Polish, and I can talk to him a little bit. And, uh, and I told him, I said, uh, Americanish, yet no American. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He opened the hood, and right there in plain, plain <coughs> bold letters, it says, <coughs> made in Detroit, USSR. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't argue with him. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're, we're about to wrap up here. Uh oh. Uh, when did you uh, when did you return to the states? When did they, you were released and came home? Well, uh, they flew us. They flew us out. Most of us 
out of uh, uh, Barth, Germany, in uh, on May the 13th, 1945, and they flew us to uh, Lyon, France, and from there we went by uh, uh, car, gondola, railroad, and so forth to a place called Camp Lucky Strike, and that was the <clears throat> that was the uh, rehab center or I should say the uh, gathering center for all former POWs. There was, must have been 100,000 of us there. And I stayed there about all oh, five or six days. We threw all of our old clothes on a, on a, on a, a fire pile and uh, got all new clothes, issued new uniforms, and we were given a partial pay of 100, 100 pounds. A pound at that time was four dollars, three and a half cents. So the next day, uh, we see a, 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 a notice on the bulletin board, if you want to fly to England, you can. Uh, just go down to the airport. So we got permission, got our leave orders, everything went down, and got aboard a, a B-17 and flew over to England. Spent about six weeks there at least. And uh, then we signed up for a leave camp in uh, Southampton, stayed there for another about six weeks. and. Then we finally got uh, scheduled to go uh, on a uh, Liberty ship home. So we uh, went by train to, uh, to uh, Liverpool, and uh, from there we sailed. I got home on the 15th of, uh, of uh, August, 1945. Hmm. Well, we're about to run out of time here. Are there any other really significant things that you would like to tell us about that you might, we might not have mentioned? Let's see. Let's see. I think we pretty well pretty well covered it. After after I got home, a real home. First of all, but I, I should say I got home on the fifteenth. Uh, we got to uh, to uh, uh, New York on the fifteenth, and I went and uh, to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, which my, was my point of point of uh, uh, departure. And I stayed in the hospital about a week, got my pay records all squared away, and I lived in Washington, Pennsylvania at the time, and I just took an ordinary bus and went home. And uh, then they gave us 60 days temporary duty, and that's where we met up with all of our buddies and everything. And then I was sent to San Antonio, Texas, and I decided to stay in the Air Force, and I continued on with my career until I retired on uh, 30th of June, 1963. Well, Jesse, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, and you tell a very good story, and we really think this will be valuable. I, I, we consider it an honor to have the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much, Scotty, and, and uh, thank you very much, Don, and all you folks here that uh, allowed me to do this. <laughs>